very different character. I'm sure you you've seen Bennett's song in Bennett's song Holiday. Yeah. Um, I was able to let go a bit more as a person and not be as judgmental, which was, I mean, as an actor, you can't be judgmental with your character because it will show through. But she's one of those characters that if it wasn't done right, then I could see it being a struggle for somebody playing her because she's really not a good person. Um, and there's things that you have to let go to be able to be that. Hey, everyone. This is Vesna. The one I've been telling you all about. Vesna, this is everyone. How y'all are? Hey. All right. Every step, I'll show you where to go. What perspective do you have on horror and what you can learn from your Cassidy Stan persona? Oh my gosh, I love, I love that question because I haven't been asked that question. Um, now, fundamentally, Eggermon's Gate is about like whether you believe in spirits or not and being kind of taken over or like being weak or being, you know what I mean? Like strength, like you have to have some strength in your spirituality even for with this kind of film it talks about that kind of stuff underlying. Um, and with Cassidy, she has to be brave because she's she was um, really nervous with everything that was happening with her husband, who she loved. So it was, she had to step outside of the comfort zone with things. And although she believed, he didn't believe, and he was dealing with the dilemma of having that, that weakness that it could feed off of. Um, so I think for me, I mean, I've, I've kind of been a little bit more open with spirituality and, and um, learning from like good and bad energy um, and just kind of like finding my place and my balance in myself with my energy because of Cassidy. <laughs> I was just thinking of calling you. I kind of had a feeling. Yeah, you could say that. From what point of view, how can Agramont's gate help in such a situation in real life? Uh, I think being sh being able to be confident in yourself um, and not allowing the demons in your past to to take you down uh, and and hold on to that that uh, bad stuff that had happened in your past, where um, it's not allowing you to grow as a person. Um, there are some things, I mean, we all have baggage, right? But the, the question is how much of it do we really allow to affect our life? And that's something that I feel you can kind of take from that, from Agramon's gate. I don't understand. He is after us and he's getting stronger. I said calm. No, no, no. You see, that's not an option for me. I'm gonna stand by Richie just like you should have. Come on. You're up. Emmett, hey! Hey, it's hey, I'm Emmett! Look, I don't know what's going on here, but this isn't acceptable. <laughs> You're right. None of, none of this is acceptable. <sighs> Eternal Code is very realistic and fair film in our era of cinema. Totally, what do you think about immortality? Would you like to be one or not? And what would you do with the Interesting question. Um, the fountain of eternal youth. Well, here's the thing. I think life, first off, we're all given life. At some point, we all know that we are going to die. That is one thing that as soon as you are born, you are destined to die. I hate to say it like that because it's not like, like some people, it's tragic, you know, some people are lucky enough to live really long lives. Um, I just think that if we were to have immortality, we would almost lose purpose of life. Because right now we all know that we have one shot at this. Um, and if we have this immortality where we're able to, you know, use this fountain of eternal life, we may lose that purpose and we may forget what the whole point of living actually is. Um, and I don't think that's good for humanity. I don't think it's good for the world because what what's the point in, in living if you know that you're going to be able to live every day? I mean, 
I'm sure if you look like vampires, right, in the stories, it's not something that they like, right? They're they're usually talking about how it's it's a death to live long because you're watching life around you just just evolve and you can't. Um, and we won't be able to do that anymore as a as a as humans as a society. Um, that's why I don't like that kind of stuff. <laughs> I get all philosophical with these kinds of these kinds of things. Okay, guys. Do you all know what to do? I don't like it, but I'm, yeah. Which historical moment should be considered a turn on the world according to the film? Interesting. Which historical moment? I think, um, well, something like, I mean, Martin Luther King, for instance, uh, standing on the, um, standing up there giving a speech, right? Um, something that is a positive moment that, that tells all human beings that we should be equal you know we should be treated fairly stuff like that i think because those moments are like motivational you know it makes people want to be better people not the negative stuff that happens you know the scary stuff the shootings or you know that stuff it just brings a negative energy it, it's gloomy it's not fun uh what can you learn from amanda london and abstruse and from what perspective can revenge be applied in our world? Wow. Wow. Well, uh, Amanda London is one of those characters that, I mean, she was like in her 20s, you know? So like probably did a lot of dumb stuff um, and didn't really think things through and, you know, understand that bad decisions can lead to bad consequences. Um, so... I think with her, it's it kind of, for me, something like, like that really is what sticks out with me with Amanda London. Um, but as for like the whole revenge thing, um, my gosh, it's so difficult. Cause with that, like, I would think somebody harming you, right? Like if, like vengeance in the world, somebody hurting you, like if you really think like, uh, like the movies, like uh, I Spit on Your Grave, deja vu where this girl had something hurt her and she these people hurt her and like that vengeance of taking it out on them because they had inflicted such pain really venging bad people um that kind of thing okay um we're gonna send a unit out right now we need the exact address 1864 willow you hear that is there anything else that you want to tell us Anything you might have forgotten. In her acting life, had you applied revenge? Well, for me, with her, it was when she, with, with Amanda, she applied it after she found out that the police were just not taking this the way that they should, they weren't handling it the way that they should have been handling it. Um, and... The problem is, is there are a lot of people that are getting away with things nowadays that have money that can help back them and relationships with people on the inside that help back them. And I think with with her situation in that character, I just remember feeling like it was a lost cause to even bother going to the police in the first place. And what what's the point if they're not going to do it i got to take this on and, and handle this on my own because they're not doing their job they're not doing what they're supposed to be doing as for telltales it was the scariest project for me to take on because of becoming a lead producer um it was the first real um major role that I was ever playing as a lead producer and it was for a TV series. So with that character being the way that she was, it was invigorating for me growing as a producer 
to be able to put that energy into that character because I felt like, wow, I'm a badass. I can actually do this, you know? And with her, she had such a confidence. Um, she had such a, really, she kind of had a bit of a swagger of her own that um, just just kind of pushed this confidence out. And, and independence too, like Allison is so independent. She doesn't need anybody to help her, but the like, maybe at some point having that kind of person there to help her is a good thing but at this moment in her life she's she's good and settled with where she's at and i think for me i had learned more about myself playing her as a woman um having the confidence um that sh that she had right and i would love to play a role like that again where i feel good as a woman and and feel like like a confident and you know whether it's you know independent like i i'm very independent i don't really need much help but like harley is the same kind of person i am when it comes to that and we don't feel like we have to lean on each other unless we feel we really have to um like I'm not dependent of him and he's not dependent of me. And we, we love that about our relationship that we can help each other with this in our dynamic and helping with with me with the producing and the acting and him with the directing and the acting. It's it's a lot of fun. It's 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 a lot of fun to play those kind of characters. And I'll tell you what, I'd love to play more like that again. What I like I said, what I love about Allison is her confidence and her independence. But I will say that she does need to um, not be so judgmental, especially towards her sister, because I really feel like the difference between them two is seriously their circumstances in those given situations where Allison had a bit more of a stronger head stubbornness to her, where I feel like her sister, she didn't, you know, she was a bit weaker and she made decisions that were easy, maybe not so right, um, because they're very, very close. And I think that that is actually one reason why Allison is not so crazy about her sister is because she sees a lot of herself in her sister. Um, but I will say with the sister, uh, I love that she's willing to do what she has to do to be able to, to to function. I mean, her life had been very hard, both of them, but she, what it wasn't easy for her, you know? Um, and you don't really know what happens to her if she's alive or if she is dead. So, you know, there's probably more to come of that in season two. <laughs> I love that he has a lot of fans uh, in F Latin America because what we love to do is show diversity we love to show that it doesn't matter where you're from um and every character in every movie is layered and relatable in some capacity for people and what i, I really enjoy being able to give fans the the moment to escape and be a part of these characters lives and follow through with them in every character and see what happens to them um, and there's some characters that are special and really stand out. There's some that are very stereotyped. There's some that you're like, wow, he didn't seem so flawed, but he made some dumb decisions, which what of us human beings haven't, you know, we need to all learn and grow when these characters are learning and growing. Do you think this film, Finding Nicole, can help save the lives of many women today who disappear out of nowhere as an actress? What message do you give the victims who've once experienced? Oh my gosh, I have to say, I, I will say that this, film finding nicole is going to blow everybody's mind um i've read the script thoroughly i have uh talked with nicole about some of these situations that have happened with her um i plan on talking more with some victims to get uh, a better sense of certain habits and certain things that they've developed because of this traumatic experience happening to them um, and what I'd like to say to the families is, you know what, guys, be there to love them um, because they have been through hell and back. They've gone to hell and back and they need, they need help. They need support. 
They need love. They need kindness. They need understanding. They need sympathy. You need to be able to uh, stand back and 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 maybe just evaluate how they are afterwards and, and see like, okay, these tendencies, they're not really okay. When I see them acting that way, maybe, maybe ask if there's anything I can do. Maybe just go and rub their back. I mean, really what it's about is just making sure they know that they have a safe circle to be able to feel protected. Um, because that's the thing is they've lost that trust in people because of whatever the situation is that has caused them to feel the way that they feel with the situation being, you know, abuse, being domestic violence. Um, there are plenty of red flags that I feel our society, our our world doesn't really look at domestic abuse the way that they should. Um, we have gone over this, like I said, I've gone over the script thoroughly, so I've been able to identify what s scenes are with what red flag and everything, but I think that we just typically, as women, have this fairy tale idea that things are supposed to be this way, and oh, but he loves me, oh, I can make him better, oh, I can be the one that changes him. Well, the reality is, and it's not even just men, it's women too. Um, you need to be able to step your foot down and hold people accountable for their actions and trust. I mean, you have to be able to trust your significant other and, and trust them with your children, you know? And, and these are things like Nicole Beverly actually has to park her car as if she is going to uh, have to drive off really fast. So she reverse parks her car in her driveway to be an escape vehicle in case somebody just so happened to go in her home. This is every day. And I'm like, to have to live with that kind of fear every day is scary, but she has to because she has to feel a sort of protection and safeness in her situation. And it's just, it's sad that people have to live that way. I haven't had to deal with abuse, physical abuse. Um, I couldn't really say the whole emotional abuse thing. I think, you know, hurt people hurt people and you come across those kinds of people in life. But um, I can't say that I've I've been. So I'm pretty naive to this situation. As much as I can read up and, and hear stories, I never had to fully live submersed into that life. And what's good about that is that when Nicole first met him, she was the same way. Uh, she didn't have really any idea what she would have had to look for, for domestic abuse to be what it is, right? These red flags, nobody really talks about the red flags. Um, the whole grooming process, it takes years and you don't realize it until you're already deep. And by that time, it's too late because you have children with them, you're married, that you have a house, you're tied with them. It's very difficult to just walk away from somebody. You can't just run, you know? It's, I mean, it's scary to have to say that the way that, I mean, it's it's just the reality of the situation. In our systems, we don't have any real good systems from the government to help save these women and, and men and children from these situations. They don't educate us enough on it. And I think, I mean, I kind of know domestic violence has been around since the beginning of time. I mean, every human gets angry. So like, what's the fine line between abuse and domestic violence than somebody having some drunk incident and, and hurting somebody, you know? I mean, there's a lot of these cases that happen daily and people just don't really talk about it the way that they should. Um, and I think that with her and this character, I'm going to be able to find myself in some of these scenarios to be able to help me with just growing as a human and knowing really what to identify, you know? So I'm excited about it <laughs> to give this message out to the world because I think that um, it needs to be talked about. It's not talked about enough. We need we need to we need to start educating people and and showing people what happens and how it happens and and what you can do if you can if you start noticing certain signs, you know, 
What can we learn from Sarah Vanderbilt, Nash and Bone, and Rebecca and Beneath the Saw? Oh my gosh. Okay, so Sarah, she is married to an older man and he has um, a teen daughter who's not really as accepting to Sarah as uh, you, would, you would like. I mean, and there's some things that you'll learn to understand throughout the story and why she's the way she was with being upset about the whole Sarah situation. But I will say this as a stepmom, you, I know that some step kids can be a bit of a pain in the butt to deal with and they can say some hurtful things, but you got to try to find a way to keep the relationship alive in a way that they know that you're there for them. Um, and being patient with them as hard as it is, my goodness. And I feel like that is like such a key thing because you, you got to remember that they did go through a divorce. So you have to be a little understanding to the process that you're a part of now. It's still a process until they're older. I mean, they're going to be affected by this for the rest of their lives, you know? Um, and I think with Sarah, that's one thing I will say is that she, she cares for her stepdaughter all the way until it's, it's not easy anymore. She still cares. Um, and I think that that's something I'd love for people to learn with her is that it's, it's out of love. Um, tough love can be a little scary sometimes too, but the intention, the intention is good. Um, and as for my character in Beneath the Saw, she is a, um, she is a social worker. And when we were filming, I went through and started diving into, um, like foster cases. Like I kind of went online and saw like what, you know, articles were posted about specific foster cases that have happened that have gone bad because that's one thing that she has to deal with as a social worker is watching kids that are under her watch being taken advantage of without her even realizing it. Like the signs weren't really there, but I mean, she didn't notice it until the end. Um, but there's, there's just a lot with just making sure that, you know, you're paying attention to the details. You're paying attention to the kid's mood. Why are they sad? You know, why are they off standoffish? Um, little things like that. And then even sometimes like, why do things look so perfect? Uh, you know, sometimes people can make things look really, really good because they know things are really, really bad. Um, and that's the thing too, is that you have, it's tricky because, you know, we kind of tell all of our films like domestic violence, um, ch children being fostered. Uh, we try to put a good message out there. We try to open people's eyes to what um, what is out there, you know, and exposing people to situations that they may never have seen or been a part of. Um, but it's as for Sarah, I really think that for me, it's just, it's just about having a good heart and just trying to do the next right thing. I mean, you just got to do what you can and, and help people when you can um, help people when it seems that they may even not need help. I mean, some people are really good at putting up a front and you have to be able to kind of pay attention to that to see like what's going on in their life for them to be that way. Um, just about caring, just caring about humans. <laughs> what is the best photograph of Lindsay's life in Snapchat? What photograph from your life do you love and why? Oh my. <laughs> I have a couple of photographs that I like in my life and why. Um, Lindsay in, in, in Snapshot. Um, she ended up, Lindsay is a character that ended up losing somebody really close to her and feeling like it was her fault and i actually want to say i'm not sure if it's the photo of the like the snapshot cover um but there's one where she's like i'm in tears i'm bawling and in that moment it was more of like a realization for her and her situation being not quite as bad. I mean, mistakes happen, things happen. And 
some things are out of our control and it was kind of like a realization for her like this is one of those things that although it really isn't good it's nothing i could have really done any differently um and i like i like that i like that you can get that arc in that kind of photo you know um and as for photos in my real life i'd have to say there's a photo of me and harley when we first met we ended up doing a photo shoot together. It was just for fun. Um, at the time, like we were both doing modeling gigs and we just thought it would be a great thing to just get some photos done together. And we were in Detroit in an alley and it was like seriously right downtown. It was a beautiful day. Um, and it was like one of those moments where, I mean, you could just feel the love and the energy connected in us. And in that photo, you can find it too. Uh, you can see it because just we're looking in each other's eyes and you can see it. Um, and then I have to say that the moment when I uh, held my daughters after giving birth, <laughs> I have two pictures. I have one like literally as soon as they're put in my arms and it was like, I look exhausted. I look tired. I don't even look, I mean, I'm not wearing any makeup or anything. I'm, I'm a wreck and there's just a lot of love, you know, it's just a feel good moment. Like here I am becoming a mom. <laughs> <laughs> so thank you so much for having me on your show i really enjoyed being here uh john jintator's channel um i would like to say my uh places where you can follow me uh i have tiktok uh katie wallen actress uh i have instagram katie wallen and it's k-a-i-t-i wallen w-a-l-l-e-n uh facebook uh facebook page um, but mostly Instagram and TikTok is where you can find me. Um, I had a blast on your show. Thank you for having me. Thank you. <laughs> yep, you have a good one. Thank you. Bye. Thank yep. You. Bye.